Okay, hello. Welcome everybody at home for joining us today. My name is Kyle Blankenship. I'm the managing editor here at Endpoints News. We have a great panel of guests lined up for today's live event on manufacturing the new normal uh, post during COVID. Before we get there, we have a few opening remarks from our sponsor at Gilead. Ken, I'll let you take it away. Hi, my name's Kenneth Kent. Um, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Chemical Development and Manufacturing Operations here at Gilead. I've been at Gilead for over 30 years and am now the longest tendered employee. Uh, it's my pleasure today to talk to you about um, our part that our company did in uh, trying to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. In the early days of the pandemic, we suspected remdesivir could be effective treatment, but uh, in fact, it might only be the only treatment. So we invested heavily upfront in manufacturing before we knew the drug would actually work. We had to, because we were committed to manufacturing at risk to try and help this huge problem that was in front of us. In the early days of the pandemic, we only had 5,000 treatments available. Um, we knew that if it was proven effective in the clinic, we we're gonna have to move quickly. When you have a long linear chemical synthesis that has to be done step by step, Time is just a luxury you can't get back. And so I guess for the non-scientists or non-chemists in the group, I would say it's a lot like making bread at home. It's easy enough to do if you have the ingredients, but if you don't have flour and you have to wait for the wheat to grow, you're going to have to wait a long time. And that's, again, time we couldn't uh, wait for. So we sort of uh, seeded the soil early on with, uh, so we could make the early starting materials to be in this position to produce millions of treatments as soon as possible. We had fabulous partners around the world in uh, North America and Asia and in Europe, and they really got it. You know, they personalized this uh, mission to create uh, this, you know, huge treatment that was needed or potential treatment at the time because they knew it could be their mother, their daughter, their brother, their sister, someone that they loved that was directly affected. And so I think they were all happy to join in and collaborate and really work together to try and end this disaster as fast as we could. And the fact was by the summer of 2020, we we're meeting all the demand. And by year end, millions of treatment courses were available. And as the pandemic peaked in the US, in fact, one out of two patients in the hospital was actually for COVID-19 was being treated with remdesivir. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of our team here at Gilead. We had the first drug that had the emergency approval by the FDA back in uh, May of 2020 and the first approved treatment for COVID-19 uh, in the U.S. by October of 2020. A lot of people say, what's next? Uh, well, you know, uh, you're never really done when you're treating viruses. So um, the first thing I'd like to say is the pharma world, I really think, showed up. You know, um, we all worked together. We didn't look at each other as, as rivals. And we were saying the only rival is the virus itself. So, you know, the team working in close partnership with all of the manufacturing partners around the globe met exceptionally tight timelines and really didn't miss a beat. Uh, and under what is very stringent and stressful conditions. Um, and because of that, you know, our industry has delivered a lot of innovation. Today, we have multiple therapies, including Vecluria, that have become available because the investment the uh, pharmaceutical industry has put into innovation. And really we have a responsibility to carry forward all the things we learned about uh, pandemic preparedness and unmet medical needs and being ready and stand ready for the next emergency if and when it arises. And um, this is something that Gilead is deeply committed to. Thank you for your time and your attention today. Okay, thank you, Ken. I like that baking bread. Um, <laughs> I wanna to introduce today's panelists. Really quickly, we are joined first and foremost by Stefan Lang. Stefan is the head of technical operations at Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Stefan, for being, thank you for being here. Also joined by Martin Meeson, who is the CEO of Fujifilm Diosynth Biotechnologies. Uh, Martin Van Triest, I promise I will not mix you two up as we go through CEO of Civica RX. And finally, Amy D. Ross, who's the CEO of Vinetti. Um, again, thank you all for being here. This is part of Endpoint's Bio 21 uh, three-day live slate of live events, and we're really pleased to have you all here for what I think is a really important topic, manufacturing, and not one that usually gets a lot of play. Um, so it's great to have this conversation, sort of get a read back on the last year and what we can expect moving into the year forward. 
Um, I want to do a one piece of housekeeping before we jump in for everyone at home. We're reserving somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 minutes on the back end of this discussion for Q&A. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A function. Feel free to submit those as we go along. We're going to reserve those questions for the end. But if you have a question for the panel writ large or for any of the ind individual panelists, please submit those and we'll try to get to all of them as we can, expecting a pretty good turnout today. So hopefully we'll have a good uh, Q&A session on the back end. Um, so. The topic of the day is manufacturing in the new normal. And we have uh, people from all across the spectrum. I figure this will be a great conversation to cover as much of the industry as we possibly can. And Stefan, I, I would love to start with you. You're our, you're our big pharma designee for today's panel. And I think given the fact that Novartis has a massive supply chain that's globalized, diversified across countries and across therapeutic modalities, you'd be a great person to provide sort of a year in review for COVID and sort of your, you and your team's experience. So uh, we've had this conversation before um, and I thought maybe it'd be great for our audience to hear a little bit about how Novartis uh, uh, did over the course of last year. Take us back to the beginning of the pandemic um, and sort of when it hit and, you know, obviously you have a massive team in place, but what were some of the specific challenges in the early days of the pandemic um, and how did you and your team sort of triage that situation as it was happening in real time? Yes, thank you so much, Kyle. Good to be here. And um, uh, just to, to also put this a uh, little bit into a perspective, we are one of the largest producers of uh, pharmaceutical uh, products, uh, uh, more than 70 billion units a year across a large network, uh, more than 50 sites uh, distributed across the globe. And of course, um, when the pandemic hit us um, uh, now almost uh, 15 months ago, I think two points were for us uh, key. And the first one was to uh, keep our associates safe, uh, to make sure that um, we have um, uh, the associates which we need to have in our facilities well protected. And for that, we developed uh, relatively quickly uh, the five golden rules, we call it, about personal protection and, and segregation. And this was for us then the prerequisite. Once we knew the core team we need to have at the manufacturing side to continue for this, that we can also continue to deliver for our patients. Um, and I have to say, looking back now, it's amazing uh, what uh, um, my team, what, what our team, but also across the entire um, pharma industry, what, uh, what uh, was made possible. We had in our supply chain almost normal levels of supply across the entire time span, um, and uh, this is this is really amazing. But you asked, what were the specific challenges? I think the the switch to this uh, uh, in, in new working conditions in our site this was relatively fast. Uh, but then the next step was, of course, uh, as we have a global supply chain set up, work with our our partners uh, um, who were. Uh, for example, provide raw materials to make sure that we uh, see also there that uh, they have the same uh, business continuity as we. And then uh, the third uh, uh, challenge was for sure uh, the uh, transportation of goods um, across the globe when you have country lockdowns. But I think uh, in close partnership with um, the governments uh, and, and the, the, the local regulators, we always found good solution. There was almost for pharmaceutical products uh, free goods flow. So all in all, I have to say, we, we manage this situation very, very well. And uh, I think it all comes down to our people at the end. And, and you know, I, I do want to focus on this because we, we, having spoken to many big pharma companies on this exact question, the, the reflection is largely the same, that the takeaway is the system really held up. The supply chain, despite a lot of challenges, held up. And I think it's interesting talking to companies both on the record and off that will tell you what the lesson and the takeaway is from that. So I want to get your take on this question. If the system that you have in place works through a pandemic, right? And despite the challenges, you get everything and the trains are still on time to a certain degree. Um, I think it's really easy to say, why fix what's not broken? Just keep the system. And so I want to get your take on how you and your team think about that. Is this, a, is this a time, I don't want to say complacency, but this is a time for really sort of broad level rethinking of how you and your supply chain work. And what do you really bake into your operations moving forward for whatever the next pandemic is going to be? Well, this was for me as well. To Stefan, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, no. Look, look um, I think uh, looking back, yeah, as you rightly said, you could say, oh, this was, uh, all easy, it was not, it was, uh, was a challenge, of course. 
um, but what certainly helped is um, we had uh, always an ambition to do so a significant stock level of our key products in the countries uh, we sell them. So typically we have stock levels of three months in the country, which gives us, of course, uh, enough uh, to, um, to avoid supply shortages. Let's also keep in mind that many of our products are life-saving and they are often no alternative. So we need to make sure that we can deliver and customer service levels uh, in our area are expected to be close to 100%. Uh, and then uh, the other aspect, which we already had largely embedded, but we now um, uh, do this uh, a little bit uh, more in depth, uh, is uh, we have set up dual supply chains, independent supply chains for our key products. Uh, now we have been reviewing, of course, that we separate those uh, in the best way also geographically, that they are less vulnerable for, um, for pandemics, which uh, hit the uh, one specific country or one area. This was really one, one uh, very important aspect uh, to help us to, to be able to, to supply. And then, of course, the way um, we can replenish and, and, uh, uh, and our throughput times in our supply chain, we're trying to further optimize that to really have a high agility for replenishment. And this applies for our own operation, but also uh, when we work um, with our manufacturing partners uh, across the globe as well. And, and the last last aspect, um, uh, I think, um, um, in the pandemic, uh, when we saw also um, incidences in our facilities, of course, there was then also the need to segregate and isolate the people. Uh, sometimes we had the entire shifts in, in quarantine. And uh, our automation um, journey to further increase automation in our operations will also help to make us less vulnerable uh, for, uh, for for these types of events. So all in all, I think um, uh, I would say a lot of good work already underway before the pandemic, which helped us. Um, significant inventories across the value chain, dual supply chain setup, which we further firm up, um, uh, increasing and accelerating our automation agenda, uh, and and a uh, good uh, and open uh, partnership uh, with, with, with our with our business partner. This was for me key, and this is the the area we continue to focus on. Excellent. And, and Martin Meeson, I'd like to switch over to you if we can. One of the big things, and it's been amazing to watch over the course of the pandemic, has been the growth of the contract manufacturing industry. And you know, we we cover the space. Uh, very closely, particularly in the last month, where you've seen a ton of consolidation, a lot of cash flying around, a lot of investment in infrastructure. And so I wanted to get your perspective on the last year. Obviously, a lot of the underlying business drivers were already in place for contract manufacturing and what we've seen. And it seems like the big question for COVID was, does it dovetail with what the industry is already doing or how does it interrupt those plans? And so I want to get sort of your reflection over the past you know, 12, 15 months in terms of what you and your team saw during COVID. Um, and then maybe you can talk about a few of the factors on what's been really driving this market and some of the really insane growth that we've seen. Yeah, so I think what you, you, you've seen even before uh, the pandemic demand came into play, that there was a very healthy demand for the CDMO uh, business. So we already were seeing growth as we were going over that period leading up to the pandemic. Now, what you've now got added on top of that, that growth, which is great, you know, because we have the opportunity to manufacture some more drugs, there's different drugs coming through, you know, some very significant ones getting approved um, recently. So, you know, it's great news, I think, for both the industry and for, you know, everyone at large that these drugs are flowing through and more and more of them getting out there to the, to the patient, which is obviously the, the end goal that we all have. You now have on top of that, a little bit of a, maybe some acceleration in some of the planning with the knowledge that there's probably sitting around for at least the next few years, a quite a high dose demand. And I think early on in the pandemic, obviously we didn't know where it was gonna land. You know, I think we've been, we've been extremely, shall we say we've been extremely good, Stefan? I mean, we've been extremely fortunate. Let's stick with good, should we? You know, we, we're getting vaccines in and treatments in so many of the modalities but I think at the beginning of the pandemic, no one knew which one, which one do you want? You know, do you, do you, is mRNA gonna work? Is it gonna be the adenovirus? Are you gonna want bacchiovirus? And none of the vaccines gonna work. And then you're gonna need antibodies. And that I think is really where you start to, to bite on the demand because the amount of time it takes to create 100,000 mRNA <laughs> vaccine doses is significantly quicker than it is to create hundreds and hundreds of thousands of um, therapeutic antibodies. So. 
I think that's why you're seeing you know, the confidence in the investment in some of the larger scale tanks. Uh, you know, obviously we announced that we're investing in the 20,000 liter, which is really focused on that, that antibody space. And, and I think you were talking, heard um, Vaz talking the other day, Stephanie, you know, he was pointing out that, you know, you can't forget about the treatments because, you know, you can't rely on the fact that going forward, you're going to be able to bite down and just initiate a vaccine. You know, there's probably either going to be a period in front of that vaccine, um, hopefully in front of it, not in, 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 in totality, where you're going to need those therapeutics. You know, so as we go forward, we need to make sure we, we take that on board. I mean, both, both Ken and Stefan are talking about this. So there is almost a responsibility to kind of work out what to do with this ways of working and the collaboration that we've seen. Um, you know, we have seen fantastic collaboration across the industry. You know, and that works for us as we partner with people because I think that I mentioned acceleration earlier and I'll say it again, it did bring into focus some of the conversations we were having both in, you know, nailing down what the investment looked like and making sure we were working with our partners on getting some good information out of them on what we're looking for. So I think it accelerated our line of sight and the industry's line of sight to what the, the in, what the landscape looked like as we go over the next four to five years. So I think, you know, with, with good vision forward, it allows you to make those larger decisions and you, you've seen us, you know, us alone investing over $3 billion uh, in expanding, not just in antibodies, but in all of the uh, modalities that we operate in. Because you forget, I think, when you focus on COVID-19, because that's top of everyone's mind at the moment, is that wasn't the first call I got. I, the first calls I were getting from, you know, doctors and, and MDs who I knew who were going, you are still going to be able to make these drugs that we're prescribing, aren't you? And, and you know, and I think like Stefan for our commercial products, as well as our clinical products, we had pretty robust um, supply lines in place, which we were able to keep supplying those through. And we were able to maintain a flow, you know, with very little disruption of those, you know, critical drugs. They're in the clinic, you know, somebody may have COVID, but there's some significant treatments that we've got out there, Stefan's got out there, the rest of the pharma industry's got out there that people want to make sure that they're, they're getting. The big change I think that you saw though, was somebody created borders in the world so 18 months ago, I, I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't even think about the border or the Atlantic or all these good things. So when you say, has it got a, is it, is it working, Kyle? You said earlier to Stefan, why will I change anything? It, it, I can run this race, but you, this, this bag of rocks you're making me carry probably wouldn't be what I would choose to carry if I had a choice looking forward. So I do think, you know, pharma has really emulated how you need to see partnership and collaboration going forward. And you know, I would really, as I do whenever I speak to them, urge, you know, the various countries and governments around the world to embrace that kind of collaboration and that partnership spirit, because it's what's going to be needed to make sure we embed the learnings. And, and Ken said it, there is a responsibility for us to embed the learnings we've got so that we are better prepared and we are ready. I can't get out of where I, I sometimes I say, if this happens again, and, and about 50% of the people I say that to stop me and correct me and go, when? It, it happens again, not if. So I'm 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 sticking with if for now. A little, little bit more feeling positive today, Kyle. Right, and, and Martin, I'll come right back to you, Stefan. I know you wanted to add a little bit on the the collaboration side, so I'll let you take the floor. Yes, Martin, uh, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I'm now almost thirty year in industry, um, and I've never seen this level of collaboration across um, different companies uh, because it was driven by this huge task ahead of us. And, and uh, when you reflect about um, what it takes to develop uh, a new vaccine or a new drug, uh, uh, and then uh, what was basically made possible within 12 months or so, uh, that's very clear that one company alone cannot uh, 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 get this uh, out to uh, billions of, of patients. And that's why we also immediately reached out to, uh, to, to, to other companies who are in, in uh, who had leads in, in vaccines, but also in the therapeutic proteins. And that's why we ended also up supporting um, um, BioNTech, uh, where we produce now um, their vaccine in Europe, and we're also partnering with, with CureVac. We had uh, also the colleagues uh, at Roche, where we offered to, for one of the uh, therapeutic uh, antibodies, who is being um, tested for, um, uh, for, for COVID-related diseases. And, and I would also hope that beyond the pandemic, uh, some of that spirit will, will be maintained because uh, I think it can um, uh, only help us uh, as, as an industry uh, to uh, uh, in increase access and uh, to fulfill our mission uh, jointly together. 
Great. And, and Martin, to switch back over to you briefly on the CDMO side, you, the word I think of the day here is vision. And, and we talked about this previously. The pandemic, I don't want to limit at all the fact that we are still very much in the pandemic, but there is going to be a day when this pandemic is no longer. And I think what's interesting looking at the contract manufacturing side is how do you prepare for that moving ahead? It's almost like the faucet has been completely turned open. You've seen, like I mentioned, a lot of consolidation, a lot of investment infrastructure, and a lot of different takes from the industry on what they should be doing to prepare moving forward. So how do you and your team think about that? What does your vision look like for what the post-pandemic is? And then maybe if we're talking about whatever the far future looks like, what do you do to prepare for whatever the next pandemic is? Yeah, and I think I said earlier when we were talking, it's all about talking with our partners. So we work with like 150 different partners. It's all about making sure we have the right conversations with them. But that partnership is extending out to you know, certain industry bodies, certain governments who are we're working with. So the focus for, for, for us, I think, as an industry is how do we make sure that we're generating these ideas? <laughs> The problem is no one's going to be very excited about spending money on creating something that they might not want. So that I think is the biggest challenge we've got. How do you keep this fresh in people's minds that it's worth spending the money to be ready? And then you have got to make sure, and I think this is where we, as part of the CDMO space fit in, how do you translate that? How do you, and we were talking with the G7 um, with these other pharmacy CDMOs the other day and, you know, making this commitment to this hundred day you know, vision from, you know, pandemic is declared to actually having, you know, something manufactured. And that is a translation at a rate that we have not seen before, it, even in this pandemic. I think it took a few hundreds of days. But, you know, getting that challenge in place, I think, is the really important one. Individual companies can contribute. So where we are really trying to contribute is in the innovation space. So you're looking at things like, can we have some very, you know, high expressing cell lines? Um, on the shelf, can we make those available to people to make sure that whenever you're making a batch, every every time a day goes by, you're getting more stuff. And I think the one of the other focuses is on new areas such as continuous manufacturing. You're getting you know a times five, times tenfold amount of product out, you know, as each day passes when you're doing continuous manufacture to to doing batch manufacture. So I think you know for us, it's about making sure we have very good conversations with the partners making sure we're focused on translating those ideas very quickly into products that's fit for human use. And then also just in our space, making sure we are pushing the innovation uh, and making sure that we leverage our innovation so that we can very quickly have a lot of product of whatever it is we need. Right, and, and Martin Ventrice, I would love to circle in with you on this. Obviously Civic RX is uh, uh, has a very different mission in terms of uh, uh, working with hospitals to create cheap drugs. And I think the pandemic, this is something that was already a necessity before this in terms of shortages, but the pandemic really exacerbated and highlighted this issue. And I think, you know, you and your team have been really um, direct in the fact that there needs to be a domestic manufacturing supply chain set up that can handle times of stress like this. So I wanna focus on that. But before I do that, I think the question that I really wanna interject here, and it's something that I frankly don't hear a lot as a reporter in this space, is the question of affordability. It's not even so much that you have to get these drugs to the patients on time when they expect them, but to get it to them in an affordable way. And I know Martin, that's something that you've been focusing on you and your team really, really directly. So I wanna jump in with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about Civic RX's work and then how you think about that question of affordability. And quite frankly, have you heard enough about it during the pandemic? Do you think the industry is doing enough to really drive that home? Yeah, so, you know, Civic uh, was definitely created to increase supply chain resiliency in a market segment related to sterile injectable drugs. And at any one time in the U.S., there's over 250 sterile injectable products on shortage. And that's according to the FDA's webpage and the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. So it's a, it's a statistic that's capped. And we focus on that resiliency based on what I learned in the proprietary part of the industry, right? You need redundancy. You need strategic stockpiles. You need to communicate with your suppliers. All those things that we mentioned earlier today, we've implemented that religiously, right, at Civica. And so we were faced during the pandemic, you know, with that crisis of everything's on shortage already, and now we have the pandemic. And many of the companies who were making sterile injectables were retooling to make the vaccine, which was a good decision, 
right? Was a good decision. But a lot of the medicines we make are essential medicines, right? Need them every day to run a hospital. And no matter who says what's an essential medicine, if you need that medicine to uh, stay well and to stay healthy or, or even alive, it's an essential medicine to you. And that goes back to affordability. When you think about these older generic drugs, they're really societal assets. You know, they were invented, they were patented, people recouped their inventions, they made profits, all under the capitalistic system that we have that I fully support. But at the end of the day, when something goes generic, it belongs to society. That's the whole idea of the patent system. And so you can make a product of super high quality and always available, but if no one can afford it, it's not really a good drug, right? And so affordability is important for the healthcare of our community that we live in, right? And so to me, our mission is to do all three of those things excellently, right? And that's really hard to do. You know, it's really easy to do two of those three, make it available and produce high quality, but to get all three of those things is really hard. And I think our nonprofit model to achieve that uh, makes that easy, an easier task. And also we're owned in essence by our members, which are hospitals and hospital systems across the United States. So you think about the opportunity to have your owner and your customer being the same person. Everything's aligned within the company. There's no tension related to who's the owner and who's the customer, right? It's all aligned. It's a very unique opportunity to uh, operate within because it's something you don't normally see every day. And so affordability is important, but supply is critical. And that's a great point, Martin, I'll come back to you, but I do want to rope in Amy here, if you can. Amy, when we spoke prior to the panel, you said much the same thing. And obviously, you sort of have a, a high up view of how supply chain works on the logistic and distribution side. In terms of the last year working, both from your perspective and from the perspective of your clients and the companies you've worked with, I think when we talked, we had a conversation about fault lines, that if you have a inherently imperfect system and you put it under stress, you're bound to find areas for improvement. So give me sort of the broad overview of what you've seen from your side um, and, and maybe some areas of improvement on the supply chain side in general moving ahead. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. I really appreciate, uh, Stefan, your comments about uh, remarkable team, individual supply chains, you know, really working well under pressure and the need for continuous automation improvement. So I think one of the learnings that we've seen um, here through the pandemic environment is the need for not just on the pharma supply chain, irrespective of where you sit, if you're contract, if you're in source, but also on the public health distribution side is a continuous need for yet more open transparency, sophistication control via, via automation, right? So I think there's, again, cannot take anything away from the, the human brute force quotient that has made it possible for essential drugs of any in any segment to get to patients in need. And obviously we have caught up with ourselves on testing and uh, vaccine distribution here in the US, other places are, are still catching up. But I do think that, you know, that rushing water through the pipes began again in a time of urgent need and really sort of global desperation. You're gonna have people putting those pieces together. No, you know, never, never a, a sense of exhaustion about swivel chair and again, doing whatever it takes, which is a remarkable, um, you know, commendation to the human, human species, I will say. However, going forward, you know, we do have an opportunity to leverage technology where other sectors have profited. And obviously we play in enterprise software. So we're biased and we, we focus all of our time and energy on enterprise scale management of chain of identity and chain of custody. But I do think even with some modest investments, particularly on the public health side of the, the channel, um, we could reap, you know, outsized benefits, especially as we prepare, not just for the next, the next inevitable pandemic, but even for how we're distributing, you know, more of the, 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 the basic block and, and tackling of care and, 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 and drugs and therapeutics. So, See a lot of yeah. There. yeah. Yeah. Great. 
Um, and, and Martin Ventris, that's a great uh, public investment in, in the public health space is a question that I wanted to highlight with you because Civica had a really, really interesting partnership signed last summer with a company called Flow Corporation out of Virginia. This is a big investment from the Trump administration. And we'll talk about moving into the next administration, but I really do want to focus on this deal that really stood out for a couple of different reasons. I think that on the journalism side, there's a little bit of a who is Flow, but having somebody like Civica on board, I think added a bit of validity to that decision. But I think it really was sort of a standalone decision by the administration that is still playing out. Obviously, Flo just signed a deal or broke ground on a manufacturing facility in Virginia, so that's getting up to speed. Tell us a little bit about that deal and how it came together and sort of what the driving impetus was. And do you think that this is really a sign of the times moving ahead? Do you see more of these coming and that sort of momentum from that really hot box summer continuing into the coming years? Well, you know, I always start this kind of response to kind of this kind of question is that Americans have very short memories. Mm -hmm. So so I'm not sure that this will stick after the pandemic wanes. Uh, but saying that, I do think you're going to see more public private partnerships going forward with the government and other institutions. There is a lot of activity in the, in Congress about these kind of ideas and activities and to try to support these public-private partnerships. You saw President Biden's plan, right? That calls out APIs and pharmaceuticals with semiconductors and rare earth minerals is something that we really need to focus on as a country. So I think you're gonna see more of it. How this developed, uh, I have always had good relationships with BARDA through my years in the pharmaceutical industry. And I had been talking to Barda about different things, different ideas we had in the sterile injectable space. Uh, nothing there was moving at any kind of pace, but you know, just having routine conversations. Uh, we met Flow and they were pushing advanced manufacturing for APIs out of Virginia Commonwealth University. And I knew Dr. Gupton at Virginia Commonwealth University. So that's where the connection was made. Dr. Gupton was working with Flow and continuous manufacturing. So that's where the connection was made. We looked at the sterile injectable supply chain and it was a long complex supply chain going all around the world from, from active ingredients to precursors all the way to the finished product. There were dozens of players in the middle. And of course, so you had this very long and very fragile supply chain that didn't have a lot of redundancy or inventory in the system, right? So when it broke, it broke all the time and it broke badly. So we put together proposals to make, how can we make that supply chain very short very simple and very robust. So on one site in Virginia, we will do an active pharmaceutical ingredients in the precursors using advanced manufacturing. We'll do the sterile injectable fill finish manufacturing at that same location, which has been, with ground has been broken. So we, everyone I think knows that. And we'll do direct distribution to the hospitals across the country. So we've shortened that supply chain out. We've taken out a lot of the intermediates and players. One, makes it more resilient in my opinion. And two, it keeps it affordable, right? Because everybody who touches it wants to take a dollar out of the system, right? So it makes it more affordable. And we then control the quality of the materials that we're producing. So from that standpoint, it's a, it's a model to add diversity to the supply chain. Right, it just happens to be this is a U.S. government funded model, so we're going to put it in the, the United States. Yeah, and this is something Stefan and Martin Meese and I'd love to hear your perspectives on. You know, one of the big we're a U.S. focused publication, so we have to be U.S. focused. It's obviously the largest pharmaceutical market as well, which adds a, a bit of more value to it, but. This idea and these calls for onshore domestic manufacturing, obviously in the middle of the pandemic, there were some really, really harsh calls of like actively repatriating supply chain over. I think a lot of people would agree that was a little drastic, but I wanna get the perspective moving ahead because this is gonna be a call that's gonna come up every year for however many years. And for global pharmaceutical companies that have supply chains in place, 
the impetus to really invest more in the U.S. is sort of a, a sort of a principle. It might not be the same thing as a company like Civica, which works here and is actively supplying U.S. hospitals. So, how do you think about those calls? And from a just from a strategic perspective, do you see value? as a global company and investing in the U.S. specifically, or is it a lot more about creating a supply chain globally that's diverse, that works for you? Just your thoughts from both of you on that would be great. Yeah, sure, can, um, go on, Stefan, you go first, you're yeah. bigger than I am. Uh, I think we have, um, of course, a, a large presence in the U.S. already with regard to manufacturing and we continue to expand that um, in, um, in many areas. Uh, at the same time, I, I like what uh, Martin described. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful example of a, sh a very focused setup with, with a lot of benefits. Uh, at the same time, this is one extreme, and the other extreme is the fully global supply chain. And uh, what we want to achieve is the economy of scale. At the same time, we want to be uh, 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 close to, to, the, to the customer, to the patient at the end, uh, and then realize these benefits as well. Uh, and I believe... Um, we cannot have all at the same time. And uh, if you look at our portfolio uh, and we, we say we produce everything in the US, we produce everything, and then the next discussion comes in each state, and then we do the same in Europe, and uh, it will not work out because we, we, we lose the economy of scale. And then um, in, in these discussions, we typically step back and ask ourselves, what do we want to accomplish? And, and when we look at the, um, the pandemic and the challenges we had, um, uh, for sure, the approach we have with uh, strategic stock levels in the country for essential medicines, uh, we have um, even increased it from three months to six months. Um, and then um, the, uh, the dual supply chain gives us the robustness uh, to, to deliver, and it can also give us the economy of scale. So I think it will be a blend for us. We certainly will have continued to have a strong presence in the US, in Europe, and in almost all major territories where we operate. But at the same time, we also need to continue to use the economy of scale. Uh, and, and I think what, what is key for us is uh, predictability and quality and, and uh, supply security, which I think we have proven throughout uh, the past 12 to 15 months. Yeah, so I mean, we're seeing the similar things to, to what Stefan's seen. And you've said it yourself, Carl, the US is um, the largest market. So, and, you know, ensuring we have capability in the US is just. Uh, is a good choice for us, um, you know, across the therapeutics and vaccines that we we manufacture. I I I would rather not see these borders come down because the problem is it creates behaviours where people hang on to things. So suddenly, you know, you you've got millions and millions of one thing in one country. You probably need a million across the whole world, but everyone's hanging on to everything. So suddenly, you not only have like the world has a problem because it has enough, but they're not flowing around. And that creates problems. The countries might want these manufacturing. It might sound good. It might be a good idea to have them on their soil. But I mean, the world can't afford it. The world doesn't have enough resources in it to put multi-billion dollar plants in every single country. I said it when I was talking earlier, we've, we, there's got to be a sense of partnership across you know, the regions and the countries who have the ability to produce these things in order to, to hand off some of the risk and agree that they'll continue to do that as we go forward, you know, with the uncertainty of what we're going to need, you know, when we get into the future. So I think it makes sense, as, as you would expect, to shorten down and have some of your product close to where your consumer is going to be, but it is creating an extreme disruption in the supply chain to have these borders being placed and navigated when you're trying to do something which is already extremely difficult. And I know Martin's saying, you know, we're shortening the supply chain, but that supply chain, it, it has tendrils. It scoots around all over the place. And no matter how close you bring it, there's always a little bit that's running off somewhere else that you're having to chase down. And here is one of the things that we're working particularly strongly with our um, supply partners is, is it's around standardization. You know, the more standard items you have, the ability to have interchangeability, the less risk you have. I know if someone's asking in the questions, you know, we're using a lot of disposables at the moment. You know, there's a lot of things that are very similar, but not quite the same. Uh, you know, so how do we actually, you know, get a little bit more standardization into the way that we do things? Because that will allow the world to have more of what it needs when it 
finds ourselves in these situations. It might not be a pandemic. It might be that you've got a blockbuster drug you know, and everybody wants that blockbuster drug as well because it's, you know, it's treating you know, some really serious conditions. So the ability to be able to do that, I think is something we will focus on, but just a few borders. Uh, regions would be good. Can we go for regions, not countries? That, that, would, that would be ideal. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll tell you what, we're moving at 140. And I do want to reserve some time for Q&A, but I can't let the team get away without talking about cell therapy. And this is something me and Amy talked about. One of the unintended consequences maybe of the mRNA vaccines is they provided a really, really interesting proof of concept for advanced cell therapies and how you produce these therapies at scale. And Amy, you know, Vanetti works specifically, not specifically, but specializes in uh, 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 supply chain software for advanced cell therapies. And so I want to turn it over to you first. And then obviously Martin and, and Stefan can talk about this as well. Um, we've seen a massive scale up in the ability to produce these. And we actually had a conversation a few months ago about patient IDing uh, gene therapy. The, the problems with tracking it as you look at cell therapies and as the manufacturing goes up. How do you have the actual tracking infrastructure in place? So I want to get your perspective on this. Um, as this market increases, you have a really interesting take on sort of where we need to focus on making sure that all of the associated things are keeping up with the investments that we're making. Talk a little bit about what you and your team are doing and sort of how you view the current challenges and logistics for, for advanced cell therapies outside of mRNA and included. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Martin Neeson, you, you mentioned that the, the the penultimate word, which is standards. So again, if any time you're coming into a new market, mRNA arguably right was pre-paradigmatic before the this moment and use case came about that with such urgency. And now we've seen you know phenomenal results. Same thing with CGT with cell and gene therapy. We've, we're at this kind of uh, critical mass of discovery, and now the issue is how do we consume? How do we consume? the mechanisms here in a way that also bestows not just make it available and high quality, but also affordability, right? How do we extend real access um, to bring the other Martin's comments in here? So I do think there's um, a lot of learnings, frankly, on COVID and mRNA I, I could talk about, but broadly speaking for this audience, if we can, just as we're kind of redefining what's a border, what's a region versus again, trying to optimize across maybe historical um, uh, lines of demarcation change the discussion to be about how do we respect core competencies, knowing that, especially in an area like cell and gene therapy, which again, it's unprecedented complexity, and we haven't achieved the scale yet, but the scale is coming. Um, the genie's out of the bottle. How do we identify where the expertise sits in this market, where it needs to develop and evolve, because it's always a continuous improvement opportunity, but then where do we find simplification? So where do we, where can we standardize? We, we took an opportunity with chain of identity, which is again, the unique patient identifier, ensuring right patient, right therapy, right time. That's a sort of table stakes for a supply chain management that assures there aren't mistakes in the supply chain that could result in really not just adverse events, de dead deadly events, right? Right now, we, there wasn't a common kind of discussion around how to unify that framework and configuration so that patients um, you know, sitting in Switzerland who are receiving therapies that are produced in New Jersey are having the same convention so that all the stakeholders who are disparate driving that process are, are essentially aligned on how they're identifying that patient through, through, the, through the, the therapeutic process. Basics, right? Sounds basics. You've seen one chain of identity, you've seen one chain of identity. There is a long laundry uh, you know, list that just keeps extending uh, across borders, frankly, on opportunities for standardization and alignment. And if we can get to some, just start bringing and blocking and tackling some of those, we can also respect core competencies because it's gonna take everyone focused on what they do best to find the right standards, first of all, and then promulgate them and enable them. And so we're, that's a lot of what we do as software. Software is just the enabling vehicle for standard setting. But if we can't standard set, this whole exciting area of personalized medicine will never become standard of care. And so that's the urgency we see. And we do, we do draw some learnings from the, the, the urgency, the scale, not as much complexity, but 
in incredibly strong scale on the, the COVID mRNA side. Stefan and Martin, this is a talking about collaboration. It's interesting looking at advanced gene and cell therapies because oftentimes the dichotomy of doing something manufacturing in house or using a contract manufacturer is really more framed as a conflict than it is an opportunity for partnership. And it's interesting that that's the case. I wanted to get both of your ideas on how you bridge that gap. Obviously, Novartis has work in cell and gene therapies and, and, and Fujifilm especially recently has been investing a lot in viral vectors and looking at how you sort of get ahead of whatever the, the market is eventually going to be for these therapies. How do you both think about collaboration moving ahead from both sides of the coin? Is this one of those things where you're seeing a lot of like actual meaningful debate about whether you're manufacturing in-house or using an outside partner? Um, give me sort of the temperature of the room on how this market is developing and where each of your companies sit in it. Go on, Stefan, you can, you, 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 you can go first. Yeah, uh, look, uh, from, from my perspective, I think uh, the entire space for seeing gel therapies with regard to manufacturing is still at a very early stage. Uh, so if I compare to um, um, antibody manufacturing, um, maybe we are 10, 15 years uh, back uh, in, in time. So there's still a lot of, uh, uh, standardization work, process characterization work. Uh, the next level of technology needs to be implemented and invented. So a lot needs to be done and then upstream and downstream in, in the analytical toolbox, QC testing. And, and I think um, um, my experience is um, with the first approval you have for a cell therapy or a cell and gene therapy product uh, with regard to manufacturing, this is the start of a lot of improvement and life cycle management activities, which go across a, 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 a large span. And I believe there's plenty of opportunity and need to collaborate uh, because uh, I think everyone can do it um, by, by him or herself. Um, will certainly uh, lead to success, but of course um, uh, it takes time and um, joining forces here. Um, also with, with uh, the key regulatory bodies, because I think uh, um, uh, we need to define as well, um, look at autologous products uh, where you have an individual product for individual patients. Uh, many of the paradigms which we are used to in uh, bulk manufacturing don't apply. And so we need to, to really uh, pioneer and further develop out that, that space together. That, that's how I see it. And I, I think it will keep us busy in the next uh, decade for sure. Uh, until we get uh, to the level of sophistication we have today in other areas. Yeah, so just building on what Stefan said, you know, how, how we see this is, again, you come back to that kind of standard and standardization piece, and, you know, we're building up, what we're trying to do is build up platforms so people can come and they know the progress that they're going to make, putting the building blocks in place and making them available, putting the plasmids for AEB, let, sitting them on the shelf so someone doesn't have to wait you know, nine months just to do a small development experiment, you know, making these things available to people is what we're focusing on. So we're platforming out AEV, uh, platforming out Lenti, you know, we're, we're, we're going, you know, putting plasmids um, on, on the shelf. These are the, the ways that I think we'll be able to support the industry as it moves forward in this space. But how standardization goes further, though, we've even started to standardize um, facility design. So you have multimodal capabilities from one design because you know that if one of these drugs takes off, you need quite a lot of it at the moment. You know, the, the amount that you're getting, the yield that you're getting from these batches is still quite small. So Stefan mentioned it there. One of the key things is working on the analytics, getting really good analytical understanding so that we can get as much of the product as we, as we possibly can. But therefore, we've got standard manufacturing modules. So, you know, we'll have one of those, one of those, and one of those, because we know we'll probably have to push out extremely quickly, and that's partly where we are. On the ontologous side, you've got, I mean, this is completely different. Can I please have a billion doses to can I please have five? I mean, this this is, this is I think, an area you know, we're collaborating with, you know, Harvard and MIT at the moment. And we talked about translation in COVID, here to work on translation of how they're going to go across. And, and our piece is focusing on, Martin, other Martin in here, how do you make them affordable? You know, it costs millions and millions of dollars to make a batch of product, which is okay when you're getting millions and millions of doses, but how do you translate that 
similar concept down to something where you're getting you know, one patient you're able to treat. It's an extremely interesting and exciting space that, that we're in. And platform standardization, working out how to get those costs down as we manufacture will be key here. And muted again. We have 10 minutes left to go and I did promise so we'd get to some Q&A. So let's do that while we have the time. If you're out there and you have any questions left that you wanna ask the panelists, please send them in. We'll try to get it. We've already got a couple of good ones lined up. Martin, this question I think might be best for you. This is true in, in the big pharma companies as well, but uh, a question from the audience. There has been tremendous expansion of manufacturing capacity, pull forward of planned capital expenditures, et cetera. What is the potential for an overbuild of pharma manufacturing capacity and how would that impact the industry? Yeah, so I, I, this is a concern I think we've all got, but what we're seeing at the moment is an extremely strong demand. Over the next five years, you've got new drugs coming into play. You've got expansions of current drugs sitting alongside um, the COVID uh, and molecules as well. So, um, you know, demand, I think, is being matched by the supply that's being put on the ground. That's obviously how we see it. And I think how, you know, many of our um, friends in the industry uh, see it as well. So I really see the ability to do that. I think the key for us, though, is to make sure that as we go forward, you do have this multimodal facility in mind, just in case, you know, you suddenly you're making, you know, a biospecific today, but tomorrow you need to switch over to, to something else. So we're just trying to make sure that, you know, as we're designing and putting a lot of the capability on the ground, it does have the ability, you know, to move very easily across the modalities with the appropriate and, you know, controls and, and segregations that you need to have in place. Stefan, maybe your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, um, very similar. So I think what, what we are seeing as well, um, um, of course, uh, uh, a strong pipeline output, um, 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 which, which ensures basically that uh, there's a constant inflow that needs capacity. Uh, and then um, the standardization, um, we, we deal with uh, in, in building out platforms so uh, that we have less and less a product specific need to build capacity, but we can re really um, uh, plug and play in, 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 in platforms, which also help us then uh, to balance uh, demand fluctuations between individual products. And, and through this, we are pretty confident uh, that we, uh, we build the capacity uh, which we need. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and at the same time, we also move in a very different space with regard to uh, the building blocks of our facilities. Uh, 10 years ago, when you built a, um, a large biologic site, uh, this is a five year undertaking. Uh, today in the, in the modular platform technology, you can add capacity within 12 to 18 months. And that's typically a lead time, which is, uh, which is uh, acceptable to, to manage uh, um, um, increase in demand, at least for the portfolio we are dealing with. And, and Martin Ventris, maybe you can give your perspective on a, on a different scale as well on that question on how to how you think about setting up enough manufacturing for need. Obviously, like you mentioned with the hospital shortages, those were pre-pandemic issues. But as you move ahead, um, how, how do you think about meeting supply and demand there on manufacturing, at least like in, in, in your very specific field? Yeah, I think um, you're never going to have a factory big enough to deal with a pandemic, right? I mean, it, it'd just be inefficient to do that. But you have other tools available to you, right? You keep inventory. You have redundancy. And our, our strategy for our redundancy is, right, we use suppliers who private label for us. We use contract manufacturers who we give them our ANDAs and they make the product for us. And now we're building our own facility. So we'll have redundancy in the network and surge capacity for these essential medicines, along with that strategic stockpile that we keep of every product we make. Now that's expensive, keeping inventory, as everyone will tell you, right? It's an expensive proposition, but it's ones that have proven now during the pandemic. 11 of the medications we provide our hospitals are were used in direct treatment of for support with patients with COVID, you know, such as pain medicine, sedation agents, neuromuscular blockers when people were gone on and off a ventilator, antibiotics. And the only way we could have done that 
is one, we knew our customers really well. So we knew how to allocate to where the need was. It wasn't like a peanut butter spread, right? We knew exactly where we needed it and we sent it there, not to everybody. And we prevented hoarding because our customers knew we had it in inventory for them if they want needed it. But also being close to the customer, having that inventory and having the trust of our members that it will be there when we need it. We never missed a dose. Not one of those we ever missed of those 11 medications. And we wouldn't have done it without the inventory, without the redundancy, and without knowing our customer. Excellent. Um, next question here, and, and Martin Meeson indicated this earlier on the single use. Here, here, I, I, this is the better worded one. With supply chain constraints we have seen, including those associated with plastic films, bags and tubing in the past year and present, does this change your view and opinion regarding single use for stainless manufacturing facilities? Um, no, I don't think so. Where, you know, the advantages of the single use platforms are, you know, significant. It significantly reduces the cost of capital in creating the facilities uh, and also allows for really good flexibility and, and simplicity, particularly when you're handling uh, multi-products. Um, like we are, it reduces the burden um, of cleaning the stainless steel. You don't have to put SFP, CIP, you know, massive, um, you know, skids in. You end up moving more cleaning materials around than you do than you do drugs. I would say though, the standardization is the piece. Everyone knows when you write something down in that bill of materials, the regulator looks at it and they go, "That's what you're using." I'm sorry, that piece of tubing that's two inches longer is not written down here. You have to go through a huge amount of rigmarole in order to make a very, very small change, which is something we're doing a lot at the moment. So I do think there is something there in how we, how we utilize these components and how we incorporate them into the processes that we are um, validating to make sure that you know, the flexibility that naturally exists in the system is able to be used if we do find ourselves in a, a shortage or constrained in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Stefan, maybe you have a take on that as well. Yeah, very similar. Uh, I think um, our objective, and I mentioned early on, do a supply chain. This applies also uh, uh, for key materials. Um, and uh, yes, the prerequisite is um, a level of standardization, which allows to have two different sources. Uh, and then this we need to really drive to, uh, to uh, a significant level of detail. Um, and then uh, we can say we have really a robust supply chain and we're in a good way on that. It's a lot of extra effort, um, but I think it's really worth it. And, and uh, because at the end, uh, uh, one small piece of filter can prevent you from producing a batch. Huh? And this we need to avoid. Great. Well, with three minutes left to go, we, we, I'll ask one more for Martin Meeson, and this is on CDMO balance. And, and I, <laughs> I don't know if there's a quick answer to this question, but maybe there is. The question here from the audience, how does the CD, how does the CDMO, how does your company balance the risk of producing a COVID vaccine and how much risk does a CDMO take versus the actual vaccine company? Yeah, so in, in many cases here, we were having to bring capacity online or ex expand capacity, you know, so there was, there's a twofold risk here. One is, you know, we've got to make sure that we can get that capacity, you know, online so that we can make something. The, the other risk is you're not, you're not quite sure if you should have done something else. So particularly when demand is constrained a little bit like it is at the moment, you, you do have to you know, make some choices that you are, you're choosing to make something that you're going to be able to manufacture. And there wasn't something you know, that you should have used that space for, for instead. You know, we're a CDMO, so the, 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 the drug risk sits with our, our customer. But obviously the risk to us is that we're utilizing the space that we've created efficiently and effectively. Excellent. Okay, we have one minute to go. So I'm going to wrap it up. For everyone at home, thank you so much for joining for all the panelists. Thanks for being here. As I mentioned before, this is day two of three for Endpoints News uh, hashtag bio 21 uh, live event schedule. So please come back tomorrow. We'll have even more from founder and editor in chief John Carroll. I want to thank everyone and stay tuned. We'll talk soon. Thank you much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kyle. Bye bye. Thank you.